Thank you, Simon. Um, uh, I'm just going to try and get my slides up because they've just gone missing. Let's just see. Uh, here we go. Um, so, look, uh, first of all, a big thank you to everyone who's participating today. Um, but I'm going to get straight into it. Why do we care about copper porphyries? Well, let's start with this pie chart on the left here. This was some analysis done by the United States Geological Survey. They looked at 730 mining companies um, and uh, they looked at what type of deposit it was. And um, the analysis came back with three quarters of, of the copper came from porphyry copper deposits. Now, the second largest uh, segment was sediment hosted. You want to be thinking about Zambian copper, DRC copper. Then up here in this segment, the other, that's all other types of deposits like VMS, IOCG, um, Manto type deposits, SCARNs, um, a whole load of other types of geological deposits. If you're not a geologist, you don't need to really know about all those different types of um, deposits. The key factor is scale here. Um, porphyry is an order of magnitude larger in size than typically than the other deposits. There are differences, but typically they're much larger. As an example, a Manto style deposit may be 100, 200 million tons of ore, whereas a porphyry type deposit, Escondida for example, is about 20 billion tons of ore for the resource currently. And that's after being operating for, for many, many years. So scale is the key for porphyries. We're now gonna quickly look at the major mining companies. Um, and, but first keep in mind that about 20 million tons of copper is mined um, annually. So first, Cadelco, their Chile, Chile state-owned um, uh, mining company, they produce about 1.7 million tons of copper annually. That's about 8% of, of, of mine supply. Two enormous um, operations that they have, El Teniente, this is Spanish for the, for the left tenant, uh, their largest producer, Chuki Camata, also an enormous, um, an enormous operation. Uh, they're the largest, but the key thing about all of these, that, you know, they're in the Andes, but nearly every single deposit is a porphyry. Um, I did find one that wasn't, and that's within their American uh, Anglo-American SUR operation. They own 20% of this, and El Soldado is a Manto-style deposit. Um, but it just paints a picture about um, how relevant porphyries are for the big guys. Um, if we move to the next slide, next, let's have a look at BHP. Now, they're a very different uh, organization. They're a diversified mining company. A huge amount of revenue comes from iron ore. Um, uh, hydrocarbons is a large part of their revenue. Now, they have talked about selling off parts of their low quality coal. So that's going to shrink that size, that, uh, this part here. Copper is a big division. Um, and then you have nickel within the unallocated down there. Now, the copper division is an enormous division. If it was span out on its own, it would probably have a market cap if we put a five times trailing EBITDA on it. It would probably have a market cap of about $23 billion. It would be about the 28th largest company in the FTSE on its own if it stood alone. Um, within the, oper within the, the segment, Escondida is its, by far its largest uh, operation. And interestingly, it only owns 57% of it, but it generates $3.3 billion in EBITDA annually. It's a collection of porphyries. Then Pampanorte, porphyries. Antamina, that's, that's an unusual one. It's actually a scarn, but it has a mineralized porphyry at depth that, that has generated that scarn uh, above. And then you've got Olympic Dam, an enormous um, deposit, IOCG as well. But overwhelmingly, um, the profitability comes from the porphyries there. Um, while we're staying with, with BHP, Mike Henry, the new CEO, made a really interesting speech in February 2020. It's worth reading. But describing their portfolio, they talk about they like big economies of scale, um, low cost assets in commodities with steep cost curves and resilient near term demand. Now, on the right here, we actually have a cost curve. This was from BHP's 2015, the last time they did a copper um, presentation. And it actually shows the steep cost curve here. 
Um, interesting, this end of the cost curve is dominated by polymetallics. That is like the antiminas of this world because they have precious metals byproducts um, and it reduces the costs. Um, this segment is predominantly dominated by the porphyry copper mines. Now, 80 mines, about 55% of total input, and that's where the porphyries dominate. You do not want to be up this end of the cost curve. Um, when the cycle turns, your mine goes bankrupt or you spend a fortune trying to keep it going. Um, in the speech, Mike Henry talks about securing more options in future facing commodities. He says that they've got a lot of pipe, good pipeline of, of um, projects for the next five to 10 years, but then after that, the cupboard starts to look a bit bare. Well, mines take about 10 years to bring on, so, so they need to start looking now. But he's really talks about this future facing BHP. More recently, they've released, they've done a lot of work on environmental and there's a, another interesting report on climate change. And it's interesting what they are saying about the commodity suites. And they look at about a decarbonizing world and, and in that world, what commodities do they like? And they, all, they say copper and nickel and they're seeking further options in these commodities. They're very clear about that. They also like potash. Um, but copper and nickel, nickel, if we go back, um, is in there. And, and I just wonder, it's a smaller market. And I, I just wonder, I'm sure they will do, they're doing work with Sensor to build out their nickel division. But I just wonder how easily scalable that is. Um, I am favorable. I am a bull on nickel. But copper is where I really think you can grow and you can scale. Um, just on Freeport, very quickly, these, they have a lot of mines, all copper. Morenci, Baghdad are the largest um, in North America. Caro Verde is a very big um, operation. And in Indonesia, they have Grasberg. But every single mine, including the two Molly mines, are porphyries. Um, just on Freeport, some very interesting comments from Mark Bristow, um, from Barrick, talking about his interest in, in Grasberg. Tier one asset, they're rare. Largest, uh, largest gold mine in the world, second largest copper mine. Um, okay, so just summarizing, why do we care in copper porphyries? Well, they're enormous value creators. They're, in fact, can be company makers. They can operate through the cycle, strategic low-cost producers, and geological links and drivers um, to other types of deposits, which we've briefly touched on there with, with uh, Antamina. Now, I want to talk about this guy. This is William Thompson, founded Magma Copper Company. Um, there was a silver mine in, in Arizona that was running out of silver. Um, he was interested in the base metals. There were further base metals that, that, that were being mined. He bought the operation, went underground, found this 10 meter thick vein called the magma vein, averaged about 10 and a half percent copper and a whole heap of silver and gold. A phenomenal vein, um, no issues with dilution. That rock today, a ton of it would be about $3,300 per ton. He was making a fortune. He got all his mining assets together, put them together in a company called Newmont Mining Corp, which of course we have today is the largest gold mining company in the world. It was the genesis of Newmont Mining um, Corporation. That operation went for 85 years. They took a hell of a lot of copper out of that mine. And the really interesting thing is they hadn't even mined any of the porphyry. The, the deeper porphyry they didn't realize was down there was down there driving the system. And there's a real analogy with the work Stavely are doing. Um, and and uh, Chris will talk about that uh, later on. Um, resolution in 95, BHP and Rio actually started drilling off this 3600 level. 27A, they came across 245 meters at 1.2% copper. They angled the drill holes. Um, they ended up drilling into the hot zone, 43 meters at 1.9% copper, and they knew they were onto something wonderful. Today, 1.8 billion tons of, of, of ore at 1.5% copper. There's 27 million tons of copper down there. Value of that in the ground is about $186 billion. A ton of rock, about $100 per ton. There's a huge prize down there, split between Rio and BHP. Um, um, they've, they've sunk number 10 shaft since. Now it took a long time to sink. It took six years to get down there. Um, mainly they, they had a lot of problems with water getting down there. Um, also it's extraordinarily hot. Um, in the winter you'll see steam billowing out from the top of uh, uh, the, the hoist surface. 
down down here it's about 82 degrees fahrenheit it's like a, like a sauna you can see the never sweat level must be a joke to, to the heat here but um an awful lot of refrigeration and ventilation needed they've spent two billion dollars to date on this project um it will take about six billion to get this into operation why well because of block caving there's going to be a hell of a lot of development that needs to go in extraction levels haulage levels and all of this needs to go in up front before they trigger the block cave um, just while we're on block caving this is a really interesting um, slide from newcrest and they point out about what block caving has done the traditional search space was this down to 200 meters roughly block caving has opened things up newcrest now see them able to drill down to a, a one and a half kilometers um, because of their ability with block caving. And that opens things up and it really makes me think about the work that, that um, Kodiak, Stavely, Alcane are doing by drilling deeper, uh, by looking deeper. Resolution, just in summary, will be about 25% of US copper supply when it comes into operation. And it's one of Rio and BHP's big future projects. This slide here is um, my colleague Simon Katz, um, one of his favorite slides. Um, this is Peggy Guggenheim. And um, the Guggenheims, they moved into mining. They started in the late 1800s in Mexican silver. They then moved down to Chile and they bought some porphyries. They actually bought El Teniente, Chuki Camata, and they also owned Bingham Canyon at one stage. By the end of World War I, they controlled 75% of the world's copper, which is just unbelievable considering the largest of the producers produces about 8% today. They made a phenomenal amount of money uh, in today's value actually calculated would be about 15 billion dollars but they are enormous value makers they actually ended up to moving into philanthropy and and peggy actually um collected a lot of art and and in, in venice just quickly on to uh, geology um just want to talk about hydrothermal alterations i'm not a geologist but i've tried my best to learn about it and i think it's worth doing just the, here on the left if you read about porphyries you can't go too far without coming actually across um, David Lowell and, and Gilbert's model from the 70s. Um, and what happens is, these high, when the magma comes up, the hydrothermal fluids, they exalve, that just means comes out of the magma and starts circulating around. Now, when these fluids are very hot, um, copper and base metals are very soluble, just like a, a sugar cube in, in a cup of tea, very soluble. As the, as the fluids move outwards, they start cooling. And as they cool, the, the, the metals fall out of solution. Um, and that's where you get the ore, uh, like over, over here. Now, you get these awful terms like potassic, philic, and propolytic, but it's worth pushing through this. All this means is that potassium, K, gets added to the mineral's feldspar. And that's just the potassic zone. Biotite contains potassium. On the propolytic zone, you get these minerals known as epidotes, calcite, chlorite. Um, but it's worth, pu worth pushing through this terminology, and I'll tell you why. Kodiak, at the beginning of the year, put out this um, discovery drill hole in January 2020. It was back here. The market really didn't care about it, but th they went to great lengths, Kodiak, to explain what they drilled. And they talked about this propolytic alteration. That's propolytic out in that part of the porphyry. They then talk about weak pervasive potassic feldspar alteration. That's the potassic there. And so they're explaining, and then finally pervasive potassic feldspar alteration, where you're starting to get 2.2% to copper. And they, were ex they explained all that to the market, and the market ignored them. And this is my argument about inefficient markets. And if you pay attention, you can, you can find this sort of stuff. Eventually, when they drilled 285 meters at 1.2% copper equivalent, it went ballistic. But opportunities are out there if you pay attention and try and break through the jargon. With Soul Gold recently, they've just put out an amazing um, release about poor veneer. They talk about visual epidote. Epidote is in that part, often found in that part of the zoning of the porphyry. They talk about potassic K feldspar biotite alteration. That's found in this part, which is wonderful. And they also talk about the chalcopyrite, which is what everyone's looking for, the ore there. So it just helps with understanding what they're talking about. Um, finally, the prize. Um, David Lowell, as mentioned, 
he had this theory, a huge um, porphyry up here at Chuquicamata, a huge porphyry down here at Salvador, somewhere in between was going to be a monster. And he persuaded the Getty Oil Company to go looking. They looked, they, there was this leached cap which had leached out all the copper. Escondida literally means the hidden one. Under here was this enrichment zone. They drilled through and found 52 meters at 1.5% copper and the biggest, the biggest mine in the world today. That is exactly what's happening in Ecuador with Solgol, Salazar and Solaris. It's the same thing. Porphyry's up here in Colombia, porphyry's down here in Peru. The theory being there are going to be some monsters in here and these three companies are doing phenomenal work already. I think we've got a wonderful lineup of people here today. Um, with that, I'm first going to hand back to Simon, but we've got um, Dr. Greg Corbett. I've learned an enormous lot from him, but I'm going to hand back to Simon.